Morning, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. My name is Steven Zerker. I'm the host of this show. This show, we're going to be looking at the Olympics, which, as most of you know, is being hosted by Japan this year with a, a one year delay from 2020. We're going to talk about the history of the Olympics a little bit and um, how it's progressed over the last few years and some of the challenges now that the Olympic committees, both the international and Japanese local Olympic committee are facing uh, in trying to host this in July of this year uh, due to the various challenges, mostly focusing on the pandemic. So we're very fortunate to have a, a wonderful guest and someone with a long history with the Olympics, Mr. Roy Tomizawa, who is uh, dialing in to this Zoom meeting from Tokyo. As you can see in his background there, which I assume, Roy, is, is your office. There's a lot of Olympic memorabilia there showing your focus and uh, attention on the Olympics over the years. Can you uh, give us a, a brief background? Of how did you get interested in the Olympics and uh, what have you been doing regarding the Olympics over, over the years? All right, well, welcome to my home <laughs> here in Tokyo. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and I've been, uh, I'm, a, I'm a former journalist, as my father was uh, a former journalist. Uh, my father actually was uh, at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics with NBC News. And uh, so, you know, he brought back a whole bunch of stuff from those games. And I guess I've been hooked on on the Olympics since, but uh, I'm also a huge sports fan. And so uh, just just always been curious about uh, about the games and very happy for them to have come to Tokyo uh, again. Um, but uh, my career uh, started in in America. I was a journalist in Philadelphia and then have moved around the world, uh, including Singapore, Thailand and and uh, close to 20 years here in Japan. Wow. And um, you focused on the 1964 Olympics in some of your writing activity. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I think when I came back, I had was living in Singapore uh, and moved to back to Japan in 2014. And of course, I had learned that uh, Tokyo had won the rights to host in 2020. And so I went to the a local English uh, bookstore, which is Kinokuniya in Shinjuku, and, and was shocked to see that there was nothing uh, written about the 1964 Tokyo Olympics because, uh, Stephen, as you may know, the, the Tokyo Olympics were considered quite a seminal moment in Japanese history. Oh, that's huge. A coming out party for, for Japan. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, only 19 years after the end of the war, uh, and, you know, Japan was bombed out and, and defeated, uh, but to come back 19 years later is to host arguably one of the most logistically complex uh, sporting events in the world. Uh, it was amazing. And I, I thought, wow, there must be plenty of books on it. I want to read up on it. And <laughs> nothing, uh, nothing in, in, in English. So right. uh, as I was a former journalist, I had written a couple of books while I was living in Thailand and knew how to put together a book and I thought I'll research it and write it myself. And uh, so that's, that's how it started. And then from late 2014, the research began and then the interviews began in 2015. And I had the- So you were interviewing people who participated or helped uh, to manage the 64 Olympics? Yeah, primarily people who were in the 64 Tokyo Olympics. So over 70 Olympians from about 15 different countries. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, so the bulk of the book uh, that I've written on the Tokyo Olympics are, are from anecdotes uh, from a lot of those uh, athletes. So uh, real stories, uh, real reactions, and uh, um, and just very proud to have met these these great people. I would imagine, uh, given the great success of the 1964 Olympics, that uh, everyone you interviewed was proud to be a part of it. I, I would suspect that that would be the predominant feeling that it was a wonderful experience for everyone and the people who organized it must have been very proud uh, yes. on how it was managed and uh, how successful it was and, and to the benefit of Japan because yeah, you're right back in 1964 I think most people worldwide were still thinking about the defeated nation of Japan yes yeah. and, then, and, and you know you can imagine these 18 year old to 25 year olds from Australia America Canada Britain had parents and aunts and uncles who remember 
World War II with uh, with uh, bitter bitter memories uh, and. Um, you know, the, the youngsters that came over probably were not as burdened by that luggage, but uh, they they understood that, you know, all they knew about Japan was what they had heard from their parents or family and saw in the in the books. And it was all, it was primarily negative. Uh, and of course, Japan at that time, uh, the economy was recovering, but, you know, things coming out of Japan were considered cheap and shoddy. Um, at least that was the perception. Uh, of right. course, it was actually changing at that time because, you know, when the athletes arrived and the things that they bought, they were just they were just overwhelmed by the the, the cameras, the movie cameras, the uh, the calculators, the, not the calculators, but the uh, watches, uh, those type of things that they bought were high, high quality, high value. Right. And I, was it the same year that the Shinkansen started, too? It was a Yes, the Shinkansen opened on October 1st, nine days before. The opening day of the Olympics, the monorail from to to Haneda opened up uh, the month before. Uh, wow. The highways that crisscrossed uh, Tokyo were basically built uh, that year or the previous year. So Tokyo was transformed. Right. Japan was transformed. Yeah, the Shinkansen is is still uh, so far ahead of anything we have in the United States when it comes to train transportation. <laughs> that, even though it, that was that built in true. 1964. That is true. <laughs> it takes forever to go from New York to Washington D.C. <laughs> All right, so I think it's important to talk about this because it kind of sets the context for people who are old enough uh, to remember the 64 Olympics and uh, the fact that Japan, in bidding for this, also wanted to make a statement. Uh, initially, it was about recovery from the uh, Fukushima disaster and uh, Tohoku earthquake and so forth. So let's talk about the Olympics now then. So you started getting involved in 2014. So can you talk about you know, how the Olympics has progressed and um, how the Japanese government has managed it, maybe up until this point. And then mm. we'll, we'll talk a little bit more later about what Japan and we all in this country are facing with the Olympics for 2021. But kind of give me your, like a brief summary of what you've observed yeah. over the last five or six years. Uh, to be honest, I think pre-COVID, everything was going to plan. I mean, it's it, it wasn't going to be a coming out party for for Japan. It was going to be a we're a mature economy, but we're a great destination. Basically, it was the 1992 Barcelona plan, game mm. plan, which is, you know, uh, tourism is important. Service industry is really important. Uh, overseas investment is really important. And so come to Japan. And as you, you, you are very well aware, uh, pre-COVID, the incoming tourism numbers were just was, were booming. It was on the uh, absolutely booming. I think the original target for incoming tourists annually for Japan was was uh, 20 million by 2020, and and they blew by that in like 2017, and then it was it was over 30 million before the pandemic. Right. Then and then they they targeted 30 million. Then they targeted 40 million before the yeah pandemic the world discovered did. Japan. Yeah, and so basically, what the plan would be is. Let's leverage that. Let's let's accelerate that. And the Tokyo 2020 would have done that as Barcelona's Olympics did for Spain, Spain, uh, Spain's uh, tourism industry. So, you know, things were going to plan. And and what we saw uh, when the tickets were first offered, the first the number of volunteers were through the roof. The amount that Densu raised as for for um, um, uh, sponsorships was through the roof, well over three billion dollars. And the uh, number of uh, tickets bought in the Japanese lottery were were through the roof. Uh, tickets were selling extremely well overseas. This was going to be the most popular Olympics ever. Wow. Yeah, my I, I can remember now. My wife tried. Everybody I knew in Japan was trying to buy tickets. Yep. And it was, you, you had like, I don't know, was it 30 to 1 chance? It, it was unbelievable how oversubscribed the yeah. ticket selling process was when they opened that up. That would be. What in 2019 or so? I would imagine. I, yeah, I can't remember. Summer 2019. of 2019. Yeah, it was remarkable. So, so leading up to the pandemic, things were moving forward, and uh, it wasn't until I guess last year, in February, when the pandemic hit. So, as as I recall, Roy, and see if you agree with me, at the government's response to that was a little bit to try and uh, maintain that things were okay 
and Japan would would host the Olympics, even though February, March, April, May, uh, the numbers worldwide began to really explode in terms of people being infected. And Japan at that time was still relatively moderate. The numbers were low, although yeah. certainly COVID was a significant factor here in Japan as well. So let's talk about that kind of like the pre-cancellation period. Well, you know, it was it was a it was a um, weird time. Um, when the Olympics were canceled, I believe it was March. Uh, not canceled, they were postponed because Canada and Australia, the, the athletes themselves said it's too unsafe, there's too much uncertainty. Um, I remember walking around very crowded streets of Tokyo, you know, without masks. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it, was, it, it, it felt very strange. Um, we had the, the nightmare of Diamond Princess on, in, on, in, off the, at the Yokohama, but remember, yeah. that, that was, you know, it, it came and went. Um, the, the Japanese government's reaction was probably the same as any other government that was hosting such a huge event with such, so much uh, sunk cost that uh, they basically were saying, let's, let's just wait and see this, how this turns out. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's no need to make a snap decision on anything, uh, uh, assuming the postponement would actually take place. So they st- they figure they had a year over a year and a half to to th- to make a solid decision on whether to cancel. So you know why should they say anything like uh, you know forget it, let's just throw in the towel and, and cancel it. So mm-hmm. of course they they would, and the IOC would definitely encourage that because the IOC had directly billions of dollars at stake on 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 television rights revenue so you know basically as probably if it were in any other country it would be let's 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 take it easy guys and and let's wait and see and so that's what they're doing um you know there's still talk today you know should we cancel the olympics and yeah that's that's what i want to lead this uh, discussion to is where we are today the new york times article that uh, i talked with you before we came on air uh that was uh, what got me thinking about this and contacting you. By the way, for our audience, uh, uh, I'm in, I was uh, the vice president of the Kansai region, the ACCJ, for a number of years, American Chamber of Commerce, which is the largest business chamber in Japan, the most influential one. And Roy is a uh, co-chair for the Sports and Olympic Committee. So, And I've, I've seen his name on many, many different sports uh, activities, sports events. So that's why I contacted him. So regarding the cost, uh, the New York Times uh, quoted fifteen billion dollars so far that's being spent. Is is that accurate as far as you know? Is that number correct? I, is it hard to say? I, I, yeah, it's really hard to say because it's probably unclear as to what is considered government uh, expense related to the Olympics. Right. Uh, but it's no doubt very high. Um, so would that be so the yes, highest? The, the numbers. I don't know. I've seen I've seen numbers for Sochi being fifty billion. I you know I oh. look whatever it is, it's high, and okay. <laughs> um, I think uh, the the question is short term. Does it feel like uh, a a uh, Don Quixote-ish type of uh, exercise? And I guess you mm. could say that uh, the question is you know is there any longer lasting impact, economic impact? Uh, and there probably is. But you know, I think uh, I think Andrew Zimbalist, an economist, has done a lot of work on this and has shown time and time again that most ec- most Olympics don't really pay themselves back in the short term. Um, uh, that it's very hard to to show an Olympic. I'm sure the '64 Tokyo Olympics probably did because there was a booming economy at the time. '92 mm-hmm. Barcelona Olympics, of course, Los Angeles Olympics because they didn't use any government money. Um, but it's it's few and far between, and there are too many ugly examples of empty stadiums or rotting venues uh, that make people believe that it's a waste of money. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I would that. argue it's not necessarily so. Yeah, I don't. Uh, other than now with this delay and the increased expenses, uh, at least I didn't pick that up in the general press that I read. That the Japan, like you said, leading up to the Olympics, the Japanese people were full on board. I mean, yeah. you couldn't buy tickets. So that issue didn't come up, and now it's coming up a little bit because of the delay and still the question as to whether or not it will occur. So let's talk about that. Let's bring us up to the present day. And uh, some of the things I, I noted here are that uh, the Japanese public, 
uh, again, this is going back to the New York Times article. I, I've seen numbers all over the place, but generally, the numbers quoted are somewhere 60 to 80 percent of them uh, do not think the Olympics should occur because of primarily public safety issues. Yeah. yeah. So that is still uh, a uh, concern. So there is, it seems to be, and the, the, the Times article kind of pointed out to this, that the government is pushing this forward, even though the general public would probably accept a further delay, if not a cancellation. I think so, I'm being it, fair in, in characterizing. Yeah. Uh, you read the situation the same way, Roy. Yeah, I think um, I think that's probably true for most Olympics that happen. There's there's a uh, a negative, uh, or you can paint a picture of negative public sentiment before every Olympics. Um, I think this one is exaggerated. Not exaggerated. This one is 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 bigger because of uh, the uh, Japanese reaction towards the COVID virus, uh, very, being very sensitive to it. Um, but uh, yeah, one thing that was in the news just recently is that the local government here where I live in Kansai has stopped the torch relay. Right. Well, I, I don't know if they've actually done it or not because no, they, 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 they basically redirect it. So they're not allowed to go through the, the streets of downtown Osaka anymore. So they'll so probably it's still continuing. The, it's just in a less populated area. Yeah, I mean, it, part of it is is the the governor making a you know a call to sort of say you know public <laughs> sentiment is so negative. Let's right. and, and 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 you know the, the you know the infection rates are spiking. Uh, yeah, that's another know. thing too, Roy. Is it uh, unfortunately, although historically Japan's infection rate, when you compare it certainly to the United States, uh, is low. It does seem to be going up. So the, oh. this the, the area that I'm in right now is in a modified state of emergency. Tokyo numbers are still quite high. So the the backdrop for this concern, this public safety concern, uh, is that COVID rates, at least on the Japanese standard, not compared to other countries, but at least on the Japanese standard, still seem to be significantly so, high. You know, you've got this you've got this weird environment going on where you go to movie theaters and people are sitting next to each other, packed in in you know watching movies. Uh, yeah. You've got Ten thousand people in the stands in exhibition baseball games. Uh, you've got, you know, you 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 have events taking place, and and they will continue to happen. Um, the to me, the what's what's strange is how slow the vaccination process is compared yeah, to other countries. Yeah. You would think that, you know, if you're if you're that concerned about it, of course you should be. Then you should be creating uh, a, a safer environment by speeding up the the vaccination process. But yeah, that, Roy, that's, that's that's worthy of an entire show in itself. I am <laughs> my 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 colleague from the University of Hawaii. I teach teaching with him. He's coming into uh, Japan April. He's already been vaccinated. Yeah, most of my family. My, my is, son's been vaccinated, and he and he he you know he he's thirty one. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So that's also uh, kind of sets the context. The majority, I, I don't know what the number is, but I would say 97 percent of us in Japan are, have not been vaccinated. Maybe it's even higher. So if, if Japan had been more proactive about that and 50 percent of the Japanese were vaccinated and felt a little bit more sanguine about the, the risk of being infected, um, then I think the public sentiment wouldn't be so strong. But unfortunately, Japan, for, for reasons that, that I can't clearly understand, uh, has been very slow. So that creates this environment. So given that, um, Roy, I've just made you the head. You've now become the president of the Japanese uh, Olympic Committee. You, you'll be the third one now, right, after <laughs> Mori. And then, then we have uh, forgotten her name, Seiko, the, the current the president. What would you do? I mean, how, what, what call would you make on this? What would be your recommendation given well i think i think the call is being made itself so the olympics are going to happen because the political will with between the ioc and the sports federations and the nocs and the japanese government is so strong it's going to happen uh so okay. i would have no choice but to sort of go ahead with I the see. plans and push forward right you could unless, delay yeah unless of course infection rates just totally go wild and 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 people and athletes start saying I ain't going right. So, so that's athletes haven't said that at all. And athletes—they've been very quiet, have, haven't they? Uh, so far, no, no, they're 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 going. 
they were they're, oh, they're, they're, right they're intending they're, to go so yeah they're right now they're in they're in go mode right oh, so okay. they're all they're all thinking like they're uh, so the the question then is how do you do you have no fans in the stands right now there are indications that there're definitely going to be fans in the stands because yeah, let's let's clarify that so they, well, some of our listeners probably read that the Japanese Olympic Committee decided not to allow international spectators. Yeah, and and uh, all these people coming from outside Japan to watch the Olympics. But as Roy pointed, as you pointed out earlier, the demand to see the various yeah. events in the Olympics on the domestic side is still strong. So basically, there were nine million total tickets of all events across the Olympics. Nine, about approximately nine million tickets, and then there were about. Uh, 4.4 million sold in the Japan lottery, uh, and then another 600,000 sold overseas. Uh, now you you figure. I think there were uh, a certain 25 percent of the tickets in Japan. Uh, people decided to refund after the announcement of the postponement, uh, and then 600,000 seats overseas are probably all gone. So basically, right now of the tickets sold, there are about 3.3 million tickets that are considered live. Like and and those include my tickets, which I bought in America, but because I live in Japan, I'm allowed to use them. I I'm pretty sure uh, that's one third. So you figure probably opening ceremonies, those type of events are fifty percent capacity, and everything else is like twenty to thirty percent capacity. Uh, and and I don't think they're going to sell too many more tickets because they've already got thirty three percent tickets accounted for. So. Um, I, I don't think it's a decision I make. The only decision I would have to make is whether to cancel all tickets or to allow a certain number of tickets. And right now we're at 33 percent. Yeah, approximately. That's, that's a kind of an alignment with the professional baseball started here last week. So Except different for stadiums Texas. are allowing yeah different percentages, but probably a third is maybe the average of yeah. what uh, the professional baseball leagues uh, Football as well as baseball are allowing into the stadium. Some are ten percent, some are more. Yeah. What I'm worried about is that they they require a vaccinated person to enter the stadium, and mine's not scheduled till August. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Roy, my plan. I'm I'm hoping to go to Hawaii in July. I can probably I'll get vaccinated there before I'm going to be vaccinated here in Japan. It's going to be quite a while, uh, I think, before I'm. I'm my well, I hope so. I hope you get vaccinated soon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have one question uh, from the, the audience here, and it may be a little bit dated here because we did talk about uh, the restriction on international tourism for the Olympics. But the question is, why can't we hold the Olympics 2021 without an audience? Um, was it a bad move to cancel it all together? Uh, for example, I think this question is, was it a bad move to cancel in 2020? Could it have been done without an audience at all? But I, I guess you've already no, it would, it would have been athletes. impossible. The, the athletes, athletes were coming. coming. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> right. So, it, 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 2020, there was no, it, it could not happen. Yeah. Could regardless not happen. of whether there were spectators or no spectators. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. So, you, you said you had tickets. Which, which uh, events are you going to, Roy? Uh, I, I have uh, closing ceremonies. I have men's and women's gold medal basketball. Uh, I've got, uh, karate, wrestling, um, and uh, I'm drawing a blank on some other. Oh, a lot of track events as well. So you know, ten thousand meter finals. Uh, oh, you have quite a few. Event wow. relay. Yeah, yeah. I was really worried because I would have lost a lot of money if they canceled it because the handling fee would not have returned. Would oh. not have returned. So I would have okay. lost twenty percent. We have another question coming in. Um, I haven't seen a lot of news for the 2020 Olympics until watching your show. Do you think it will be a success or a failure? Will COVID be better by July? Okay, so let's start with will COVID be better by July? <laughs> it, it's not looking that way at this point would be my response to that. Roy, would you agree? It's, it's no, I, think, I think the number of vaccinations will increase. So I think the 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 momentum is is heading against COVID. So. Uh, but all right. So but then I, I'm not a I'm not a virologist, so uh, okay. But do you do you feel, given the circumstances and what we've talked about so far, that the 2021 Olympics will be considered a success? Oh yeah. I guess it depends on the audience. Maybe the government no, will certainly. It, 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 
it, it's 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 going to be successful because every Olympics, no matter how bad the run up is, has fantastic. You gather the best athletes in the world. You know, I I know that Japan is going to be cheering like mad because they're Japanese athletes. That you you see them every day on Japanese TV about how they're doing and and what their prospects are. And then 30 minutes later, they'll talk about how terrible things are with COVID, but they totally forget it when they talk about the athletes. So when the Olympics happen, there's going to be tremendous cheering around the world for the teams. I know, you know, in America, they're, they're talking, they're already talking about which players are going to play on the men's basketball team They're you know, and, and you actually have LeBron James saying, I, I think I might play right. Which he didn't say before. So, uh, I think the interest is going to be huge when the games start, as is true with every Olympics. Like the Rio Olympics was a disaster leading up to it, and then when that started, all we have are great memories. That's true. Yeah, that the the forecasts there were quite negative, but it turned out the virus, uh, corruption, uh, strikes, yeah. un, unfinished venues, uh, terrible right. economy. And uh, uh, from the Olympic Committee perspective, the probably the majority of revenue comes through. Licensing rights worldwide, primarily, I guess, the United States, whoever, whatever. Network broadcasting rights, yes. Broadcasting rights. So if it runs, then there'll be a lot of money generated there. And it might be that given the struggles that the, the worldwide interest in the Olympics, the fact that they're actually happening uh, in, the, in the midst of the pandemic may drive more people to watch it as, as yeah. kind of an escape yeah. from their, you know, their lockdown world. If it's, Although what I've seen is that uh, most sports, the broadcast, the ratings are down across the board. Are they right now? Okay. Yeah. I, even even when COVID started, um, mm. people have figured out, particularly younger people, figure out that they have far more choice in 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 capturing their attention. Okay. So it, the you know sports are going to have to work hard to gain back the audiences. Hey Roy, unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time. It was so interesting talking to you. And uh, it's easy. You're a journalist, so I, you you've been in my role. So it's so easy <laughs> to talk to you. As a guest, is there anything you would like to mention to the audience? Any publications or anything you have upcoming that you would like to, to reference? No, no. I, I mean, I've got okay. my blog, The Olympians. I've got my book, 1964. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're curious about how Japan recovered after the war and, and put on the greatest show on Earth in 64, please read my book. Okay, fantastic. All right, Roy, thank you so much. I appreciate you waking up early and participating in this. And to my um, my viewers, I'll be back on in a couple of weeks with a Looking to the East once again. I'm planning to do a review of how Biden has done as a president uh, 90 days out from a Japanese and also from uh, a European perspective. So that's what I have planned two weeks from today. Thank you again, Roy. Thanks, and, Stephen. Uh, yeah, enjoy the Olympics. Thanks, I will. Take care.